What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode here at the Mask and Health Solutions Podcast, where I'm joined by Eric Everhard. Eric, how are you today, sir? Excellent. Glad to be here. Hey, man. I've, we've been talking off camera, and I already like your vibe, and I like the truth that you're bringing, and the fact that you're shedding a whole lot of light on things that have, you know, been darkened by a lot of misconceptions. So first and foremost, though, for the for our listeners, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in your career. Well, I mean, if we go sort of big picture, I mean, you know, obviously I'm an author, men's coach, and a professional porn star. And now what I do is I teach guys my skills, the things that I've learned over the last 24 years, so that they can have elite level sexual skills in the bedroom. So the journey actually started um, circa 1997. Uh, I was in your neck of the woods. I was yeah. <laughs> at the time I was going to um, the West Coast College of Massage Therapy oh, in nice. Vancouver, Canada. And I was on lunch break. I'm sure you know this magazine quite well, the Georgia Strait. Oh, I know. Um, Classifieds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, I grabbed a copy because I'm eating my lunch on break. I want to see what the band listings are, what's going on in town. So I'm just flipping through to, you know, kill some time. Flipping, flipping, flipping. And then, you know, suddenly, bam, there's this about four, four inch by four inch ad. And they're looking for men or actually women in couples to do a porno movie in Vancouver. And I was like, oh my God, right? (laughs) Um, Because especially back then, 97, me, it was shocking to see that in in any magazine. It was totally taboo. And uh, I had previously dated a girl in Vancouver who used to joke around with me. She would say, well, you know, okay, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you're hung. You could, you could do that for a living. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, sweetheart. Um, <laughs> because, you know, you can only take that sort of stuff with a grain of salt from anybody, right? Because mm-hmm. it really wouldn't matter how good you were. If, if someone's dating you, they're going to say you're the best in the entire world. So, yeah. Um, so I didn't really think too much about it. But when I saw the ad, then my brain was, now twisting and turning. And I was thinking, you know, she always said I'd be good at that. Maybe, maybe this would be something to try. And so I called them up and, and then, you know, they hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> so Which much I to totally that. <laughs> understand now. I totally understand after you know, 24 years, especially back then, yeah. you know, there was no performance enhancing drugs of any kind. Mm. It was very binary it was very black and white it was like you could do it or you couldn't and it was you know it was so blatant that you could or you couldn't right so and it was only probably the 0.1 percent of guys that could so most companies were unwilling to try out new guys invest any money in a guy because when you when you really think about it there there's so much that's riding on this small act of getting an erection right it's like everybody's paycheck the makeup artist the catering the location the director uh the girl the company everybody's money is riding on the fact that you can get it together when called upon with the hot lights and 20 strangers gawking at you it's not easy no i couldn't imagine i mean would like one thing that i've kind of read into or looked into they say a lot of guys that do try out that say you know I, I got the gumption for this and when they're on set they can't even get it up is that true for the most part like when you oh just... yeah yeah very true very true and is that it just was sort of interesting too because i would say before before the performance enhancing drugs really started to enter the industry, you would have really two camps. And I mean, there were other ones, but two major camps that I would see from kind of a psychological profile that would make good male performers. So you had one group where they were the strippers or ex strippers. We had a lot of ex strippers, right? So they were comfortable being naked. And then in the other camp, you would have guys that had been kind of shit on by women when they were younger. Interesting. Yeah. 
so so you 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 so on one hand you, know, you had the the guys that were super comfortable being naked on the other hand you had these group of guys that were so it was almost like they were so horny that the 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 shame or the guilt that might be present in someone normally they could totally slough off because of their desire being much higher if that makes sense no yeah it's kind of like his level of desire trumped everything trumped everything else yeah and and typically they would actually end up being the best performers interesting why is it because they were just more aggressive more vigor not even aggressive just hungry is the only word i can use that would suffice you you have to have a certain level of sexual hunger to show up every day when things aren't ideal and that and it's a lot of those lessons that i i try to empower my clients with right like you know in a situation when things aren't ideal can you still get it up can you still find ways to get interested in the girl can you still control your cum shot can you still do all these things Mm -hmm. even though we are now in less than ideal circumstances because you can't expect that every time is going to be absolutely ideal and you know mastery is a lot of things from my viewpoint but really when i think about mastery okay it's mastery of mind it's mastery of body right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to have real sort of sexual mastery. Those are the two areas that we need to master. And so this is why, you know, being able to calm yourself, being able to be centered, being able to focus on the girl, being able to focus on your sensations of your body, being able to focus on what you're feeling, all these things play a massive role in allowing you to obtain an erection, you know, anytime that you want, or to be able to control whatever part of your body, you know, anytime that you want. Um, So those are a lot of the big pieces that I took away, especially from the industry, because everything is riding on you. And with that pressure, you're either going to rise, you know, you're going to rise up to it, or you're going to fall against it. And it's the same like you see, in sports all the time, right? You, 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 we watch the Super Bowl, we watch the Stanley Cup, whatever your, your choice of sports is. Yeah. And there's always that team or that player that just cracks under the pressure. Yeah. And you're like, man, they were so good. Why all of a sudden? And it's like, well, the, the pressure just became too much. And that's sort of what, as an actor, I had to learn to deal with. You've got all this pressure. Okay, what are my tools? Because... Mm-hmm the average guy doesn't even get a chance to explore what what tools there might be and he doesn't necessarily have the necessity to do it either because it is slightly different and i'm gonna say kind of massively different for a guy to fail with his girlfriend at home yeah versus fail in front of 20 people you know, on, on a live set, right? Like the, the level of, of, of failure is different. So the stakes are greater. And I think when the stakes are greater, there's more possibility as well. Like you can really start to learn things about your body because if you don't, you're not getting paid. Yeah. And if you're not getting paid, well, nobody else is getting paid. So it's just the, the enormity of it, at least for me, is what led to a lot of my different theories that I started to put into practice. And, and these are just the practical, tactical things that worked for me. And that I think everybody can sort of use and learn from. No, a hundred. Well, I mean, that, that does make a, that makes all kinds of sense to me from my perspective. Cause it's like, yeah, you, I've been there. It's like, you know, it's been a week and finally get it in and you're like, ah, oh, dear Lord, you know, sorry. Uh, okay. I'll get you in like an hour or two. Give me some time, <laughs> you know, but there, there's no harm, no foul. She's like, all right, fine. It's been a while. I'll forgive you. You know, it's not like you're on a set and everybody's got to eat from this. It's, it's like, we're depending on your performance, dude. And if you crack under the pressure, yo, we're all screwed, man. We all got to go home. And it's like, there's nobody, there's no backup plan. Right. And like, yeah, and, and I've to, to your point, I've been there exactly where, you know, I've started a scene 30 seconds in, like the urge to orgasm hits. And 
I got to look at that clock and be like, wow, I, I better get it together because I got another 59 minutes and 30 seconds to go. So how do you deal with that situation itself? Like, because for myself, like I, I trained myself through edging to last longer. And that was a PE exercise that I did as well, right? And mm -hmm. I found that it was really, really helpful because I, 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 for some reason, man, like, I don't know, doggy style just got me all kinds of excited and I couldn't hold it. Like, it just went through this weird phase because it started doing Kegels and that like also made me premature ejaculate. So I'm like, forget this noise. I'm not doing that again. And then, so I started edging, discovering that, but I also found, like you said, you got to discover the sensations of your own body and edging kind of taught me that. But in your case, did you learn on the fly, like on the sets where you're just like, all right, diamonds are made through pressure or was there some knowledge that you had coming in to a set where you knew you're like, okay, I got another 58 minutes of this. How do I suppress my, you know, my desires to come right now? Now, for me, it was, it was definitely trying everything in the moment to figure it out. So it was, it was the pressure that led me to the discovery. Interesting. Because I got in there, I had no ideas about what's going to work. You know, it's just like, <laughs> oh my God, like I got, I, I really got to hone in on my body and figure this out because like, I, I can't, you know, it's like you're owned, right? Like yeah. I can't come, like it's not allowed. Okay. If it's not allowed, well, we have to make sure it doesn't happen. Okay. Well now, now let me think what, what, what might make it so it's not going to happen. Okay. Let's try this. Let's try that. Let's work, you know, work some magic. And then you start to see threads of what works. Right. Yeah. So then next time you're on set, the same thing comes up. You're like, oh, OK, last time I, I managed to get through with this and then maybe it doesn't work this time. And then that sends you down another rabbit hole where you're like, oh, wait, I discovered this new thing. And then maybe you hear from an, an old veteran like, you know, there was a couple of vets that gave me a couple of tips that um, led me down some other rabbit holes. Right. So I'm like, oh, OK, well, OK, I can try that. And that's what you know they've tried. And because I, I've never met. A single performer that didn't at some point struggle with sensitivity issues i mean it's just natural yeah Every, everybody's gonna have a bad day you know the the pros it's just okay it's a bad day today great what can i do to Suppress. alleviate the problem yeah and you you and you start to have a very business-like attitude about it mm -hmm. and i think I think that's very useful also even in relationships because if you can if you can keep your emotions in check now well now you've got freedom yeah right because the the tsunami of the negative thinking I think is one of the worst things that guys go through right yeah. we we get there because you know it's even affected me before and that's where I learned like okay well what what can stop this thinking because even in situations where I was working for, like, I remember plain as day, probably one of the times I was the most nervous was the first time I had to work for Rocco Sofredi. Oh, what? yeah, interesting. Oh, yeah. And, and that, that would happen to a lot of guys, right? Because, you know, he was the, the biggest star and it's like you're working for him, right? It's like it's a big Super deal. famous, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was, it was tough, tough going out of the gate. I was like, okay, <laughs> I, I can do this. I've done this a thousand times, right? Like, where does my mind have to go? Because it's only an issue of my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say there can't be some physical issues, but it's rare. And, you know, that's part of what I also talk to my clients about, which is strategy right? Like where, where are we having a strategy in the bedroom? Like when I talk about that with guys, they're like strategy, what do you mean? Well, yeah, you want to set yourself up for success. I mean, you know, does Tom Brady go out on the football field? Like, just like, Hey, you know what? Let's just run whatever play comes to mind. <laughs> no. Fuck that playbook. Like, let's just burn <laughs> it. Let's just try shit. No. Yeah. So, you know, even from, from a perspective of the bedroom, you know, like I, I could use you as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know doggy's a problem, right? Oh, yeah. So we're not starting with that. No. Part of our strategy is, okay, we're going to find the worst position first. I always tell my clients, worst position first, right? Because we want to desensitize our bodies and we want to accustom our bodies to the sensations. Yeah. So we don't want to go out there and do what we know 
is going to be problematic. Right. And if yeah. we know a position, whether it's missionary, whether it's cowgirl, whether it's doggy, there's always going to be one that typically guys will struggle with. So then our strategy starts with, OK, well, what what is the positions that are problematic? OK, mm -hmm. those have to be last once we've started to desensitize our bodies. Then we can look at, OK, well, what kind of apparatus is going to help or hinder, you know, what sort of positioning is going to help or hinder there's so many different factors that we can use to either increase or decrease, decrease sensations. Yeah. And, you know, this all ties together with my theory about the five minute marker. So ultimately that's what we're trying to achieve is this five minute marker. And if you do that now, it's very likely that we can last as long as we want, because all we have to do is in a sort of, analogy it's 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 almost like breaking a horse right yeah it's the same thing it's like the, you, your penis is the stallion and we need to make it submit and that's sort of what happens around that five minute marker period interesting because i do find for myself now like the way i start off like i told you i, I edge to condition right mm -hmm. and then the other thing too you mentioned the mind and even for myself it was weird because like i would edge standing up imagining that i was in that position i'm like what the hell man like it still feels like this is going to set me over the edge a lot faster than if i was just sitting chilling out or whatever right and it's interesting because like yeah the mind body connection and like you said too the desens desensitization of it where it's almost like you got to be in for a bit and it's almost like you create a groove that's what i found for myself it's almost like you get into your rhythm it's like okay cool all right, cool. Okay. All right. You know, I got this. And it's almost like just bringing down your level of excitement, I guess. Cause I'm not gonna lie. I get hype. You know, I'm happy. I'm, I'm not doing this for a living. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's a Tuesday night. The kids are asleep. Let's go. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you want to make sure. And like you mentioned earlier too, from that professional perspective, right? It's like, I got to make sure she comes first. So mm -hmm. that means that, you know, it's probably gonna take like, 20 minutes to like 45 minutes usually it's a lot longer than i would like because i'm like oh you know five minutes i could just roll over <laughs> <laughs> but you know obviously she works in a different way but that five minute marker what does that look like like usually you just want to go into a position that's not as stimulating i guess get them to just get in the flow and then from there they can switch positions or how does it look like well so the five minute marker was something that i saw time and time again play out you know and like i say everything that i teach you know it isn't from a textbook you know it's not from some university class it's from you know my more than ten thousand hours on my back so one of the things that i saw over and over was that even when you started a, a scene and guys would be sensitive they'd be pulling out they'd be close to coming when they could make it to that five minutes yeah that's when the level of sensitization started to drop Interesting. so if we look at it and this is sort of how i look at it right um what we don't what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to last 40 minutes 45 minutes we're trying to last five because it's that 0 0.01 seconds of penetration to that five minutes that's our problem so now we got to grab a whole bunch of tools out of our toolbox in order to make it to that five minutes, because typically by the time you get to that five minutes, now you've got control. Most guys lose it long before the five minutes comes. Interesting. So we want to chunk it down rather than having this big, you know, lofty goal. I'm going to last 45 minutes. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's go for five. Five very likely is going to lead to 10. Okay. 10 is very likely going to lead to 30. Like it, it, yeah. it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy almost, right? Um, uh, Nassim Taleb, um, he talked about something called the Lindy effect. And it was the longer something's been around sort of tells you the amount of time it's going to be around even longer, right? And this is what happens almost with your ability to hold off from having orgasm. Mm -hmm. you know, if you can last, you know, 10 minutes, you can last 50 minutes. Yeah. It's not hard. The, the, that, that gap to go from 10 minutes to 50 minutes, easy. The gap going from two minutes to five minutes, that's hard. And so yeah. that's where we want to have our tools and we want to have our toolbox. And we want to pull out the different tools that we need 
depending on the situation and depending on what we're feeling and depending on the woman, yeah. because what you're going to need is going to vary depending on where we're at, who the woman is, and what type of pussy that we are dealing with as well. Because that, you know, it's something that I, I write about in my book where I talk about the four different types of pussies and, and the lock and key theory. Whereas there is anatomical alignment and that matters more than anything else. I'm, I'm always, hmm, I don't know, disappointed is the word, but I find that this concept of sexual chemistry gets bandied about and I don't find it's true. I think what people are referring to when they think of sexual chemistry is purely sexual alignment. Um, Interesting. And, and I, I can tell you where I sort of discovered this. Um, the first time uh, I was doing a scene, this was probably 99 or 2000. And I remember plain as day, I'm out at this pool and it's supposed to be a threesome, me and these two girls. And it's like some swimsuit calendar movie or something. Or in swimsuits. <laughs> and so I talked to the director and I'm like, okay, I want to do something high energy. So I'm going to probably start them both in doggy. I'll go back and forth and, you know, I'm going to create as we go. Yeah. He's like, okay, action. Let's go. I remember penetrating the first girl and literally it was like one, two, three. I don't even know if I made it to five strokes and I was like, whoa, hold on. And because uh, I was ready to come and I, I pulled it out and I thought to myself, okay, well, I'll go start having sex with the other girl. Maybe the time that it takes for me to transition from one to the other, my body will calm down enough. That was my thought process at the time. And so I did it and lo and behold, it worked, right? So I yeah. go. And I, I could have had sex with this woman for 60 minutes. No problem. Easy. I totally have control. I'm like, awesome. Great work. So I don't know. We probably had sex for three, four or five minutes, something like that. I go back to the other girl that was in doggy. Again, it's like five strokes. I'm like, Whoa. I'm like, okay. And that was the first time I was, I really had the epiphany. There is a serious qualitative difference going on. What is it? Interesting. What is it? Yeah. And, and so over the years, that's what I started to parse out, at least from, from my viewpoint of what I was feeling, feeling. and experiencing. Yeah. And that's where I came up with the idea of the, the, the four different types of pussies, because when you, when you map out enough of them, right, and you have enough experiences, what I found is, is you end up with two very distinct types on the edges. Um, one that I, I came to, to, to term uh, velvety and the other was what I termed granular. Neither better than the other. Just and I, and I, I like to make that distinction. Neither is better than the other. They are vastly different though. And depending on your penis, it will respond to one or the other in a positive or negative fashion. Interesting. But if, and that's why I said it's like a lock and key. It's like if you took your key right now and try to open your neighbor's lock, like it maybe work. it doesn't fit in or yeah. maybe it fits, but it doesn't turn it. I mean, but it's, it's not very good. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when men and, and, and women have really bad sexual relations because they're trying to put the wrong key in the wrong lock, like wow. there, there is no amount of communication that's going to fix that. That's interesting. I mean, that would be like me saying, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to let, let's have a talk about the NBA. And if we communicate long enough, I will turn into seven foot five and I can play. <laughs> it's like, no, no, it's not going to yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah. Five foot 10 over here. That's it. Right. <laughs> yeah. No amount of communication is going to change and make me seven feet tall. That is super. So why do we yeah. sit there and you know all these sexologists? If you just communicate better, it's not changing biology. Wow. Well, that's it's not changing biology. Ah oh, man. Okay, so now the million the million dollar question in my mind is like, how does a dude go about finding this? You know, finding the perfect punani, I guess, because it's almost like okay. 
how do you vet for that process or do you just got to go out there and live it? Well, from my perspective, part of it is you have to live it, but part of it is you have to be conscious of it. I guess. Yeah. Cause it's almost like, cause I mean, not many, myself included, I've never had a threesome, you know, uh, but it's like you're jumping from one girl directly into the other. So it's almost like you had that, like, you had that contrast in the moment, man. I don't think yes. a lot of people have ever had that. Probably and when you do, the then, then it becomes very apparent that, okay, these are, you know, qualitatively different. And so, so to bring it back to where I was talking about the four different types, the four different types, there's, you have um, velvety, granular, and those are at the extremes. Mm -hmm. And then you have tight and loose. So if we look at it as almost like a, um, you know, one of those uh, stereo equalizer, you know, um, shifts that go from, you know, minus 10 to plus 10, right? So it's like you, you have this sliding scale. And if we have the two bars, so we're sliding somewhere between all the way velvety, all the way granular. And, you know, each woman is going to be some sliding scale in between there. She could be at one of the polar edges. Same thing when we talk about vaginal tightness, mm -hmm. right? Oh, and yeah. again, the big thing that I want people to understand is nothing is better than another. It's how it works for you. Case in point. Um, I remember this was years ago. I was on set with um, uh, one super famous actor who's very well hung. And I remember him going on and on about how he hated women with tight vaginas <laughs> because sense. they hurt. Yeah. He's like, I'm horny. I want to have sex. I don't want to spend 20 minutes trying to work this in somehow he's like, Nope, it, it, it's not fun. It's horrible. Right. Because, you know, as kids often like that's the old locker room talk is like, Oh, the tighter, the better. Tight and from yeah. my experience, no, well, like the, I've found more than enough where it's painful. It's not comfortable. Like I know the level of, you know, tightness th th that I want. Yeah. Right. So again, you know, nothing is better than another. It's just, how does it work with you? Mm. Um, there was a, a famous director I was quite good friends with. And one day, this was probably, it was probably in 2003. He calls me up and he's like, Everhard. He goes, I just, I just shot this girl and she has the most amazing pussy ever. And he was emphatic emphatic he goes you you need to work with her i was like oh my god like if he's saying this i mean it must be you know paved with gold or something at this point <laughs> i thought literally right yeah and um and so lo and behold a couple months later a, a company booked me to work with her and imagine my excitement i was like my my buddy just said this was the greatest ever ever yeah i'm like oh my god like i'm expecting this experience and then we did it and i was just like eh? Like for, for me, n not even like, you know, average at best, average, you know, like really? from a sensation perspective. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, this is all very subjective. It's what's going to work for you. And that's why I said, you know, like the, the, the kind that are granular, it might be exactly what works for your penis and what feels amazing. And you're just like, oh my God, that's the one velvety that could be it, you know, some, yeah. it, maybe it's, um, you know, a, a girl who's, whose pussy is more elastic and you're just like, oh, this is, this feels like heaven. It's just about finding that right fit. So, you know, and the thing is, you know, when we talk about, you know, okay, the, you know, the perfect pussy, it's, it's not that it needs to be something that, you know, this becomes all guys are focused on, not at all, but you do have to understand it because, I think, and I know I've been a victim of it too, where you can get into a relationship where the relationship is awesome and the sex is not. Yeah. And if the sex is bad because of a biological limitation, you do need to understand it's never going to change. And so then you have to say, okay, am I willing to accept this? Or am I better off saying, you know what? We just aren't meant for each other. And you know, let her find somebody that's a fit for her and, and yourself find someone that's a fit for you rather than staying in a relationship that may turn out to not be fulfilling for either one of you 
and just staying in it on this hope, this hope that somehow it's one day going to get better when, again, I, I'm not going to magically turn into being seven feet tall, that it's not from a biological perspective ever going yeah. to change. Yeah, that's interesting because do you think that's why so many relationships are probably in dire straits these days? It's kind of like, you know, people are trying to make it work and it's like a square peg round hole kind of situation that they just don't know about this. Cause this concept, this is the first time I've ever heard this man. Like it's completely foreign to me. I, I'm willing to, I'm willing to bet that it is. Mm -hmm. um, because we've, you know, I've talked to a lot of men and if I talk to them and we have an on, honest conversation, they will remember some girl mm -hmm. and they'll say, Oh man, the sex with her was so good. And then I go, why? And they don't really have an answer because they really haven't thought about it in those terms. Interesting. Yeah. And then if I start to dig deeper, many times, a lot of them, they'll be like, yeah, because it was like, you know, the, the, it was this specific type of pussy and it just, the sensations were mind blowing and all this stuff. And so then they think it's, oh, it's this sexual chemistry. No, it's, it's you guys had the right alignment. Now, does that mean that your personality is aligned? No, <laughs> that's we're not talking about the that's same thing. That's a different here. thing. Yeah, it's a different ball game. We are just talking about from a purely sexual sensation-based perspective. Of which, you know, sex. The amazing thing about sex is it hits so many things, right? Like, you know, there's the physical component, there's the emotional component, there's the mental component, there's the spiritual component, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it, 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 it is more than just physical, but we are physical beings and we are in this, you know, Newtonian reality, yeah. right? As much as we can be. So these things do matter to what we can sense with our five senses. Yeah. Wow. Because it makes perfect sense. We are all completely different. And just like in any other aspect, like, from my side of things, you know, doing PE, I'll talk to guys who are all like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I got these dimensions, you know, this guy's like four inches big or long and he's like six inches thick. I'm like, that's an interesting uh, setup you got there. And it's, everybody's built differently. And I imagine for women too, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, no, nah, you know what? I prefer a penis that's like this, or I prefer one with a slight hook at the end of it. I prefer this, that, and the other. So I've seen it from the opposite perspective where it's like, I'm talking to other guys and getting their perspective. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, and my wife and this one and like and it's interesting because now i'm like oh, i never looked at the pussy the same way <laughs> no and I've, and I've had this conversation with women and it's funny when you have an honest conversation with women and i and i bring up the same thing most of them always say oh yeah because i say i say okay imagine what type of penis felt the best irrespective of skills just yeah. shape and size and they'll go uh-huh and i'll be like yeah, and every time if you found a, a one that was shaped this specific way, right? You know, whether it was big head, small head, big shaft, little shaft, you know, uh, glass-like steel erection or kind of like, you know, had a little bend to it, you know, whatever it was, they'll say emphatically, every girl that I've ever talked to, there will be a specific shape. They're like, yep, that one just felt better, irrespective of the skill. So the skill then is much is placed on top of it. Yeah, but there is something about hey, just this specific shape and size, just by itself felt better, and that's that's the same thing we're talking about in terms of of how it is for guys with the women too. Interesting, because I'm like, it's almost like we should add that to a Tinder profile, you know, make an algorithm and be like, all right, so the, what kind of vagina do you have, and what kind of okay, this is a perfect match. <laughs> but it is something that I feel could be taken into consideration in the dating game that is probably negated by a lot of people. Because until you brought it up, I'm like, yeah, that actually makes sense. Because you listen to women talk about what they prefer, you know. And from a guy's perspective, you just hear the tight pussy thing, right? And like you said, yeah, to a degree, it's okay until it's not. And you're like, mm, you know, it's a little bit too tight for my liking and I can't really get in there. Yeah, well, the, I mean, and that's the problem is that, you know, from a woman's perspective, you know, our, our, our stuff is all external. So yeah. everything can be seen, it can be seen by other guys, can be seen by all the women. But because women are internal, you know, there's this idea that they're all the same, which is which is utter nonsense. Yeah, right. But true, we kind of go in thinking like that. Well, you know, <laughs> it's just how they look on the outside. Not at all. They are totally differently structured internally. Mm -hmm. We can't see it, but you can feel it. You can definitely feel it. And it makes a huge difference. 
And it's that feeling, you know, the, the thing about sex is, well, what is going to keep you going back to do it? Yeah. It's an enjoyment, it has right? to feel amazing yep. it, it, because it needs to have a addictive quality to it. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, novelty runs away really quick. And I know even from my years of, of being a porno actor, I used to always say, literally the best scene I will ever do with a woman will be the first time. Really? And then first scene is always just, the best. Just because business after that. Well, because in terms of in terms of how male bodies work, right? We respond to new. Mm -hmm. Like and and I'm not here to 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 you know judge it either way. It's just it's just a fact, right? Yeah. You know, it's like you know, not the best way to say it, but you'll have so you know, older guys will be like, "Well, what was the cure for my erectile dysfunction?" A younger woman, right? Like it's the cliche <laughs> thing, but it's like, but you know, we do respond to new. We're visual creatures, mm -hmm. and you know, our penises will respond to, "Hey, this is a new woman," but that excitement lasts one time. Yeah. Right. It's like, you know, so from that perspective, that's why I say, you know, the, the best scene will always be the first one. After that, the newness is gone. And now we start getting down to, okay, well, what is, what are the, what is the quality of the sex that we're having like together? How do we actually, you know, blend together as a couple? How do all mm -hmm. these things come about? Because if that's not there, you know, it, it'll be, well, we did it a couple of times and then it's like, well, not interested anymore. Interesting. You got to have something that keeps you in the game and keeps you interested. And it needs to have that, right? It needs to have that intense sensation. Yeah. One question I have for you, though, because as you brought that up and you, you talked about novelty and obviously, yeah, man, I'm, every guy would love to just have a new girl every week or every day. But in your case, man, where you'd been with so many chicks and that one chick where you were five strokes in and you're like, okay, something's different here. Have you ever had to work with a girl like that before? Or, or have you had to work with her before, I guess? And, and did you feel the same sensation? Almost like, bro, this is different. Like this one really sticks out to me. Oh, no, I've had, I've had lots that really stick out. Yeah. Um, but that's also now because I know my particular type. And this is why the one thing that I try to have guys learn or sort of at least open their mind to is that there will be a sort of type that is going to work better for them. Mm -hmm. So that then when you understand that and you come across like, so it's like, okay, if you have figured out what works for you, what works for your body, well, now you have something to screen for Yeah. in terms of, you know, men and women have all these lists of what they're looking for in the right partner, but nobody's ever thrown that one in there. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, well, if we've now discovered, hey, you know, this is what would keep me from, you know, being a philanderer, cheating on my spouse, doing all these things because, well, you know, this is the only person that I want to have sex with now. Okay, well, if we know what that is like, well, we should be screening for that. Yeah. And we should at least have a, a sense of it because then when you come across it, you can say, okay, you know, immediately, you know, if, if a really fulfilling sex life matters to you, you can say, okay, well, okay, we're now we're, we're in the game. Like this could be mm -hmm. marriage material. This could be a relationship, but this is something that I know, I know is going to keep me satisfied long-term. Yeah. Right. Because I mean, I think for a lot of us guys, I mean, unless you're someone who really just wants to be a player like we, we want to have somebody to, to have a good relationship with and settle down and have kids and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, and if we're going to be doing that long term, you know, we're going to do it in a, in a monogamous um, container. Well, then we better be really happy with the container that we're picking. A hundred percent. Yeah. Right. That's kind of, I don't know if it was a deciding factor for me, but I'm like, I love this pussy. <laughs> <laughs> I tell my wife that all the time, you know, I'm like, Hey, you know, feel delicious. I'm still here and I ain't going anywhere. So yeah, I yeah. think and, it, it and does come into play. It does come into play. Right. Um, and, and I think it's important uh, because if you're not truly happy at some point, 
as men, you're, you're going to start thinking about something else. And it doesn't mean you're going to act on it, but maybe you just get resentful. Um, and then the resentment sort of, you know, starts to enter the marriage. Um, there's strife, there's mm -hmm. fighting, all these things that stem. I mean, I think two of the biggest fights that most couples will have money, sex. Yeah. Usually right? it's a lack of both of those things, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Either the sex life isn't good or the financial situation isn't good. No, you, you are right about that. Cause I mean, I think divorce rates over, what is it? They say that over 70% of divorces, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it's just the Pareto principle. I'm going with 80, you know, usually stem from financial issues, but I, I feel that sex has to play into it too. Right. Cause a lot of these guys, I mean, if you're stressed out, you're not making enough money, you might not be able to get it up. So maybe it's playing into that side of things too, without us even knowing it. Yeah, yeah, who knows? But they're definitely two major factors when it comes to relationship strife and the causes that, you know, all sort of couples are suffering from today. A hundred percent. But uh well, another thing I wanted to ask you about is this new book you got coming out. You got to tell us uh, about it. Give us the title and uh, lead us through what inspired you to write this book. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, my 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 new book that'll be coming out in, uh, in a few months uh, is called uh, The Tao of Eating Pussy, A Porn Star's Guide to Clitoral Mastery. And uh, it was it was really something that, you know, I've always prided myself on from a technique perspective, um, something that I spent a lot of time honing different techniques. And for me, at the end of the day, it's one of the greatest skills that can sort of separate you from the rest of the pack of suitors and lovers out there, because mm -hmm. it can really turn you into a unicorn of sorts, right? Especially because, you know, often women will need clitoral stimulation, clitoral contact to have orgasm, right? Yeah. And if you can give a woman an orgasm at will, well, there's a lot of power behind that from a man's perspective, right? So there's, there's the fact that you become a unicorn in her eyes. There's the fact that you sort of gain a little bit of soft power over the relationship. And there's the fact that you can use it as a skill for a lot of different things. You can use it to overcome performance anxiety. You can use it to overcome premature ejaculation. You can mm -hmm. use it as a distraction technique in a lot of ways. So there's, you know, in the book, I go into all the different mindsets that are required, the techniques that are required, and the different ways that you can use pussy eating, not only to better your life, but to obviously you know, impact all the women around you. Because like I said, it does, it's probably the single most high leverage thing that you could learn as a man, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that, man. I feel it was a game changer for myself. And I'm like, I figured out how I was doing it right. You know, it's funny, because <laughs> like, I'll be talking to my friends. And I'm like, you remember back in the day, where you thought you were the man, you're like, I'm doing this properly, man. And it's like, I'm all up in her ass. I don't even know where I'm at, bro. I'm just, ah. <laughs> and then finally, later on, I discovered, I'm like, oh, the clitoris. I'm like, I'll just suck on this for a while. And it's like, ooh, <laughs> whoa. It's like, you know, you're, you're looking at yourself like a superhero afterwards. So what I think you're doing is awesome, man, because you're going to let a lot of people discover this power a lot faster without having to go through the exploration phase of, I don't know where I'm going. It's almost like you're giving us a roadmap. Well, and that's, and that's true, right? Like, that's the whole way that I looked at it was, well, you know, here's what I've learned from the last 24 years, right? In to, to sort of get that knowledge, you'd have to go through the same sort of crazy experiment. And that's not for most people, right? Like most people, you know, they, they have their high school sweetheart, they have, you know, the girl that they're in love with, and they just want to make them happy. Like that's yeah. it. Right. So it's like, okay, well, rather than do the crazy life that I've done here, yeah. how about I've done this crazy life for you? I can hand it to you on a platter and you can just run with it and run with the information. Yeah. And honestly, it's probably helped a lot of relationships out there where a lot of the guys are still lost after years and years of being together. Cause you'd be surprised, man. 
you know, I'll talk to some girls that I've worked with and they're just like, well, you know, and they'll, they'll talk about their sex lives and I'll just be like, well, who are you married to? Because it's like, he has been together for like 20 years now and he still hasn't found the clitoris. So that's kind of an issue. <laughs> well, but, but it, it sort of makes sense, right? Um, I, I, uh, I worked with one, one client um, and uh, when he came to me, there was a problem because, you know, he, he, he wasn't able to get his wife off in using anything but his fingers. And, uh, and so we broke down what, what he was doing and, and I gave him some solid tips because I could see that, that his, his technique and his structure was off. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they've been married for 15 years and it hadn't happened, you know, a, a two hour call with me, he, he sends me a text message. He's like, he's like, you'll never fucking believe it. I got her off in three minutes. Wow. And, and, and this was the first time in, in 15 years. Right. Jeez, so, yeah. you, you know, the, you, you need the intersection of experience and knowledge. Yeah. Because well, experience is good. If we do the same thing a thousand times the wrong way, we aren't learning anything. Insanity. <laughs> but, but, but if we don't know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, okay, well, you, you need to have the experience, but you also need to have the right knowledge. Right. So if I can impact you with the hows and the what's, here's yeah. how you do it, here's what you do, go. Now you can take that knowledge. And now gather the experience and have the right experience, and then you can have success. And that's really what I give my clients is like, I want you to have success. I want you to be a winner. And I know you can do it. You just don't have the information because the information is not out there. I mean, God, I remember growing up in Calgary and uh, sex ed class, you know, <laughs> Canada, I'm sure it probably hasn't changed. But nope. I mean, there was even what there wasn't even mentioned that the penis went in the vagina. It was literally like they had a picture of you know a well, drawing, not even a picture. Like... It was a drawing, of a penis <laughs> drawing of a vagina, and they just kind of talked about it. And it's like, man, you got to figure out what you're supposed to do with these two things. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was horrible. Yeah. So there is no real information, and then the information that you're getting is mostly coming from clinicians with zero experience. So they're just writing, right? They read some books from some people that read some books from some guys that read some books. And it's like, you got all these book writers. I want some doers. Exactly. I'm done with the writers. Let's have exactly. some doers, right? Let's have some boots on the ground information to see, okay, well, what is working out there? You know, Because well, that's what matters. Yeah, man. And it's kind of from your perspective. And I'm in the same boat as you, right? Like, I do understand that we need theoretical we, we need some of that, you know, knowledge that comes from the books, yada, yada, yada. Like, I get that because I, as a personal trainer, that's what I do as well, right? It's like, I've taken their book knowledge, but if I don't apply it, I don't really, you know, I can't magically go and tell everybody, hey, do eight to 12 reps, and I guarantee you, you will get swole. It's like, you got to play with certain concepts. And then I'll go talk to the guy at the gym who's been doing it for 20 years and was Mr. BC 15 years ago. And he's like, no, nah, bro, do this X, Y, Z. And then I do what he says. And his experience was freaking gold, right? Just yep. beautiful, like work to a T. And then I'm looking at my textbooks like, but this guy's a PhD. You know, it's like, what does that mean if it's not actually helping people get to where they want? And if it's going to help couples like you dropping the knowledge bombs that are actually relevant and will actually make a difference, empower to you, first of all. And second of all, it's like, please do not stop because we need that knowledge, man. We need it more than ever. I find that it's like, we don't need any more books, <laughs> books that are not written by people who have actually gone and done it. It's like, no, I want to learn from somebody like you who's like, hey, this actually works because I tried it. It's like, come like, so what you're doing, Eric, man, I am loving it, man. And keep it up. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love your gym analogy, because it's so poignant. I mean, I, you know, as a gym rat myself, I remember, you know, you would always go into some gym and you know, they, they'd have the, the personal trainers, right? And yeah. you'd have the one where it's like, you know, he's got the personal trainer shirt and he, he got the certification <laughs> and he looks like he's never lifted a weight. Oh, like, don't even get me started on right? that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but then, and then you'll just have that, that gym rat guy who is just 
jacked, right? Yeah. And not jacked just because he's, you know, putting some shit in himself. I mean, he is training and he's training right and he's doing something that is clearly, clearly working. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, who do you want the advice from? Because I can, you know, I mean, great, you got a certification, but I mean, I can bench press you. And we got this guy (laughs) over here. It looks like the next coming of Arnold Schwarzenegger. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's kind of, it's it's boots on the ground strategy because obviously the guy who's jacked out of it, you know, jacked to the gills. So he probably did his research and probably did his knowledge, but he's like, okay, now I'm going to put it into, you know, take that theory and let, let's put it into work. Let's, let's actually test it, you know, real time and see how it actually does. And then I'll draw my conclusions from there. So it's almost like in the same vein, you're like a scientist who's like, okay, I'm going to take these ideas, apply them. If they work, they work. If not, then it's just BS that I don't need to apply anymore. So I imagine for your clients, it's like, dude, when they talk to you, it's like you go direct to the grain and you're just like, do this. And they're like, holy shit. I mean, for a guy to come back and say, hey, I made her come in less than three minutes after 15 years. That's a testament to your knowledge, man. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's one of those things where during my, you know, the height of my career, I was always testing things, you know, because you, you don't know. I mean, I would even go, I remember when, um, when I'd have to go to shoots where it was, you know, condom only, I, I went, I was buying all these different condoms. I'm like, okay, I'm trying this. I'm trying this. I'm trying this. Like, <laughs> what is, what is going to work? Right. Because it was something that, that lots of actors would struggle with, you know, even if they could do the job in front of all the people. Now you add a condom onto it. It was a thousand times tougher. And, and I got to where I was probably 85 to 90% as good as without, I could do everything right. Yeah. Like flawlessly. And, and you'd have other guys in the scene, they were completely woodless. And that was again, setting myself up for success. So I always brought my own condoms. I knew exactly what worked, but I also spent the time to research and then experiment. Mm-hmm. And then as I did the experiments, when I found something that worked, start asking the questions. Okay, why? Why is this suddenly working? And then I started to see, okay, it's this type and it's this type that does this and this is why it works. And again, even, even with my long-term clients, I, I, I do a whole week with them where all we talk about is condoms, right? Because you know, if you're in a situation where you need to use them, well, we don't want you using something that's going to be detrimental, mm. right? Because what if we use the wrong condom? Now we got to deal with, you know, uh, not being able to get it up or we're dealing with erection issues or we're dealing with all this other stuff that now can compound the problems in your mind, right? Because yeah. now you can have that negative tsunami. Okay, well, you didn't get it up this time. And maybe instead of you know, understanding, well, it was because I use this condom and it's going to be okay. Some guys internalize it and they say, oh, something's wrong with me. Something's broken. And now, now we have that negative tsunami happening yeah. that could impact the next time you step up to bat, because now you're going to be thinking about the last time you've internalized it. And so now you're creating that as your new reality. And so now, of course, you're struggling because you're thinking back to the past and you're bringing that past into your future. So we don't want that to happen. So it's all these types of things that I go through with my clients. So I say, okay, here's what I've learned. Take it, apply it. Tell me what you think. Interesting. And before we end off today, I got to ask you, what is your favorite client story? Oh man. Um, when I think about like my favorite client story, uh, was a client of mine who uh, one of one of my all time favorite clients, and um, I remember when he he wasn't necessarily a guy who was into pussy eating. He was like, ah, I could take it, leave it, whatever. But he didn't know what he was doing, mm-hmm. and so then I taught him my techniques, and he went out there and he and he had this uh, lady that he'd been seeing, and uh, he used them. And I mean, we get on our next coaching call and he's like, 
I can't believe it. He was, <laughs> he, and he, he, he was, he was so amazed because he felt like he, he literally had the power of God in his hands. Because he was like, he's like, man, he goes, I could make her come over and over and over and over. He goes, he, he goes, it was, it was so empowering to know that now he had that ability and he could just make it happen at will. Yeah. And you know, of course, you know, she went from because they had been, you know, they had been sleeping together for a minute. And so it, it totally turned around where she was like, yeah, it's okay to, oh my God, like, I don't ever want to lose wait. this guy. And he was yeah. like, he's like, she won't <laughs> leave me alone now. It was comical. Um, but yeah, that was probably one of my, one of my best stories because not only then did he learn to love it, mm-hmm. but he totally got her obsessed with him simply because he got so good at it. And he was able to literally call his shot in terms of getting her off at will. So. That was that quite is, good. I love that, man. It's almost like now I, I know that feeling too, where it's like as soon as you, it's almost like you just leveled up. You know, you're playing like a video game. And it's like, bro, yeah. I just beat the big boss, the clitoris. <laughs> I just took out Tyson and Punch Out, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Like I am. <laughs> I'm unstoppable. Yeah. Before you totally. go, Eric, tell us about your website, tell us about your books, socials, all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, everybody can. Find me at ericeverhard.com. If they want, they could go to ericeverhard.com slash secrets. And uh, I have a free giveaway where I go into the six secrets to last longer in the bedroom. So they can get that if they go there right now. And then I also have uh, uh, crushingperformanceanxiety.com, which is my program using all the tools techniques and tactics that I learned over the last 24 years to be able to overcome anxiety in the moment so that you can get hard whenever, wherever, wherever you choose. So yeah, if they go there, they can find out all that stuff. And then, you know, if they just want some, some free daily wisdom, they can catch me at uh, Instagram at Eric Everhard official. Perfect. And the YouTube channel too, might add. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eric Everhard official there too. Yeah, I'll add that up and I'll make sure it's all in the description below. On that note, guys, we'll see you in the next episode. Eric had an absolute blast. And I'm going to have to have you on again, too, man. Yeah, let's do it, man. All right. To the next one.